This is going to be Exodus chapter 15. And I'm going to talk about the Lord, the almighty man of war. In verse 3, it says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And that's what we're going to talk about. You see, the Lord isn't some soft, puffy teddy bear in the clouds, but rather a man of war. That's a lot different description than the world's going to present him to you. What you have in chapter 15 is Moses' song about the Lord, the man of war. That's what chapter 15 is about, the song of Moses. And the entire chapter has reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming is an event that's going to happen in the future. After the tribulation, we're going to come back with the Lord on white horses. And he's going to bring in his kingdom. And that's, this. the entire chapter has reference to that. And I'll point that out as we go along. So chapter 15, you got the song of Moses. So let's look at verse 1. It says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he hath he thrown into the sea. But look at that, triumphed gloriously. I got that underlined. The first thing about the almighty man of war is his triumphant record. He's undisputed, undefeated. He can't be touched. All he, all he does is win. He can't lose. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, He always causeth us to triumph in Christ. So he triumphs gloriously, and he always causes us to triumph since we're in Christ. Since we are behind the MVP, the Lord Jesus Christ, we always get the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Uh, Job 20 and verse 5 says, The triumphing of the wicked is short. So when it just looks like the devil's winning, that's it. It just looks like it. When Pharaoh looked like he was winning, that's all it was. It looked like Pharaoh would win. That was only for dramatic effect. Psalm 41.11 says, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. And see, our enemy, death, hell, the grave, the devil, the flesh, when it's all said and done, they don't tri triumph over us. When it comes to unclean spirits, he makes a show of them openly, triumphing over them Colossians 2:15 says when he was on the cross he made a show of them he he uh, triumphed over them so he has a triumphant record he triumphs gloriously he triumphs gloriously the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea that's the next thing. He will throw down. And you don't want to throw down with him. He triumphs gloriously. And he will throw down. You know a slang term is. When somebody's about to fight somebody. They say let's throw down. Okay. Not a good idea with the Lord. With the man of war. Pharaoh and his riders are thrown into the sea. It says. They tried to throw down with him. They got thrown down. Pharaoh. He pictures the Antichrist, who is the white horse rider in Revelation 6. You know, you see a white horse rider. That's the counterfeit white horse rider. Jesus Christ comes on a white horse, but you got a guy showing up before him on a white horse as a counterfeit. And that Antichrist, he's going to get thrown. He's going to get thrown down, but into a lake of fire, Revelation 19.20. You see how this is very, very similar to the second coming to what you see in the second coming pharaoh the horse and his rider got thrown into the sea the white horse rider in the tribulation thrown into a lake of fire and the lord's gonna 
wipe out all the king's horses and all the king's men. And they're and Pharaoh and his army was drowned. The one who breathed the breath of life into man has the right to take it away. And verse 7 in this same chapter says, He overthrew them that rose up against him. They tried to throw down, they got thrown down. In Acts 5.39 it says, But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Try to overthrow what God's doing, you're going to get overthrown. Isaiah 50 and verse 8 says, He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. That's a prophecy of Jesus taunting the devil and his boys while he's on the cross. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. And then he triumphs over him. You see that? Now verse 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. That's the next thing. He's my strength and song. He is our strength. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. It's all about His might. We can't do it in our own strength, but we got His strength. He is our strength and song. Specifically here, He's the song of Moses. He has become my salvation. Without Him, I have no salvation. Without Him, I'm headed for hell. Without Him, Israel would have been overtaken by Pharaoh. Without him, the sea couldn't have stood up. They ha would have had no way out. He is our God. Much better than all the gods of Egypt that were overthrown, that he triumphed over with the plagues. It says, And I will prepare him in habitation, my father's God, and I will exalt him. And there's coming a day when the Lord is the only one that will be exalted. In Isaiah 2.17, it says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. He's going to triumph over them. Verse 3, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And if you want to be on the winning side, you need to become a part of the Lord's army not the army of darkness you see of this world. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back on a white horse to set up the kingdom. In Isaiah 63 and verse 1, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Dyed garments, he's got blood on his garments. They're red. It says, This that is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? See, he's got that blood up to, the blood's up to the horse's bridles. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name's called the word of God. He said, I have trodden the wine press alone and of the people there was none with me for I will tread them in mine anger. And will trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart. And the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me. In my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger. And make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. That's the Lord the men of war that you're going to see at the second coming. And you're going to be on his side behind him or you're going to be on the receiving end of that in front of him. Jesus doth judge and make war. Revelation 19.11 Righteous war. And you're not going to like him 
when he's angry. That's the next thing. You're not going to like him when he's angry. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the sea. They didn't like him when he was angry. They probably wish that they could have went back at that point when they seen that water coming back down on top of their heads. The depths covered him. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. The great and the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. You see this? You're not going to like him when he's angry. You think the Hulk is mean and strong? tough and scary when he gets mad wait till the lord unleashes about six thousand years of vengeance and fury and anger on you at the second coming it says they are consumed as stubble you won't like him when he's angry verse 7 said his wrath consumed them as stubble there's some words that you you got to look out for when and it'll show you most times it's talking about the second coming like that word stubble it says in joel 2 15 referring to when we come back with the lord at the second coming it says we're going to be like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble nahum 1 10 says they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry you know it also talks about in the bible how all faces gather blackness it's going to be like an atomic blast going off in people's face. It says in Joel 2, 6, Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. Nahum 2, 10, She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins. And the faces of them all gather blackness. And they just get devoured up by the one who is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Have you read that verse, Hebrews 12, 29? It says, For our God is a consuming fire, and He's going to devour them as stubble, fully dry. You're not going to like Him when He's angry. In Psalm 59, 13, Psalm 59, 13, He says, Consume them in wrath, consume them, that they may not be, and let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth, Selah. Consume them in wrath. That's what he's going to do at the second coming. They're not going to like him when he's angry. So he triumphs. He's got a triumphant record. He will throw down. You won't like him when he's angry. The almighty man of war controls the elements. Everything you see, he's in control. Even when it seems like he's not, he's in control. Look back at verse 4. It says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. He's got power over waters. He's got water manipulation. He can take any amount of water and move it anywhere he wants to. It says, his chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. You know, what does that remind you of? That reminds me of Matthew. In Matthew where he says, it would be better for a millstone were hanged about their neck and be cast into the sea. And you know what uh, Egypt had been doing? They had been messing with those little ones. Just like it says in Matthew 18, 6, it says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about to his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. It's exactly what happened to Pharaoh and his army. They were taking all the male children before and drowning them in the river. They shouldn't have messed with those little ones. The Lord uh, sees that. The Lord hates hands that shed innocent blood. So the depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Though the chariots, the chariot factory in Egypt, 
would definitely be hiring overtime. Be hiring overtime required with rigor and hard bondage after this because they done lost their chariots here. They done lost most of their chariots. And he leaves them down in the depths of the sea. And he also puts our sin in the depths. Look at Micah 7 and verse 9. He says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. He said, he will bring me forth to the light. Execute judgment for me. The Lord, the man of war, the righteous judge. He's, behold his righteousness. He brings a righteous war. And Pharaoh and his army, they sink like a great millstone. Revelation 18.21 Revelation 18.21 says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence so that shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. They shouldn't have tried to. Th they shouldn't try to throw down with him. Verse six: Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Check out Psalm two, and verse nine. It says, "Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces, like a potter's vessel." Just get smashed to itty bitty pieces. Because the Lord's right hand is so strong. Much stronger than any man on this planet. Much stronger than any being ever existed. Mark 16, 19. It says, in Mark 16, 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the right hand man, the right hand man. And he has the, the strongest hands. And do you see that the Bible talks about the right hand in a good light, the left hand in a bad light. His right hand, it said, dashed in pieces the enemy. He sits on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The Lord's right hand. You can't withstand it. The, the, the Antichrist is probably going to be a man left-handed. And you'll see the contrast through the Bible. Left hand spoken negative. Right hand spoken good, just like Paul gave the disciples the right hand of fellowship. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, thou consumed them which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together, the flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. He controls the elements. He controls the wind, the water, and he is a consuming fire. The same nostrils that put breath in Adam blasted away an army of Egyptians. In 2 Samuel 22, 9, it said, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Job 4, 9, it says, By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils they are consumed. You know, the devil's the prince of the power of the air. He's got some power. God's gave him some power to bring some storms, things like that. Have some power over the airwaves. But when it comes right down to it, it's all God's power. It's all under his power. By the blast of God, they perish. By the breath of his nostrils, they are consumed. The enemy said, 
I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. And that sounds just like the devil. Because what does he say? What does he say in Isaiah 14? Go to Isaiah 14. It says in Isaiah 14 and verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in, thy, in, thy, in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the side of the north. I will ascend up above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So, back here, Exodus 15, they said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But they were brought down to the bottom of the sea. And they said, I will destroy who does that? Well, John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So they're on the devil's side. But we're on the Lord's side. The Lord, the man of war's side. And they said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. The stuff that they'll get from Israel that they got. Everything they got. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. See, that's what it's all about. They're lusting for something. It says in James 4, 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Why do unrighteous wars come about? Because people's lusting and coveting after stuff that's not theirs. Back in Exodus 15 and verse 10, it says, Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. He did his blow with the wind. He can he controls the wind. And Genesis 8 1, he brought a mighty strong wind there. It says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. See how he controls it all. You don't want to go against the almighty men of war. You're not going to come out in one piece. It says in Exodus 15, 11, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? He already proved... Exodus 12, against all the gods of Egypt, he brought them plagues. Who and who is like him? Nobody was like him. Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Look at all the wonders that he did for Israel. Thou stretchest out thy righty hand, the earth swallowed them. Just like number 1632 Korah and all that appertains to Korah gets swallowed up. They go down alive into the pit. Revelation twelve sixteen, the devil tries to send a flood in the tribulation to uh, drown out Israel. But look what happens. Revelation twelve sixteen, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The Lord controls the earth. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Psalm seventy-eight fifty-four. Psalm seventy-eight fifty-four. 
says, And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. There's his holy habitation. And back to Exodus 15. It says, The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. So what's the next thing? Well, I skipped one. The next thing was, you will lose. Notice the I wills of the enemy. Consider Satan's I wills in Isaiah 14, 13 through 14. Talking tough only leads to a fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pharaoh went down. He sank as lead, it said. He went down. Pharaoh found out really fast that none of the gods were like the Lord. Who was like him among the gods? The Lord said in Isaiah 44, 8, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. That's what the Lord said. He's looking around. He's like, Is there a God beside me? I know not any. Who is like him among the gods? None of them. You'll lose every time going against the Lord. The earth listens to him. Just ask Korah. Just ask Pharaoh. Just ask the devil in Revelation 12, 16. Imagine fighting a warrior who controls the turf you're fighting on. Every game is a home game for him. And look what it says in verse 14. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. They'll hear and be afraid. They're going to hear all about it. And Joshua, in the book of Joshua, it says in Joshua 2 and verse 9, that, that harlot said, And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So they heard all about it. And right now you're hearing all about it. This should be a warning that the Lord is a man of war. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold in the inhabitants of Palestina. The Lord has the art of intimidation. The people are afraid. They're amazed, verse 15. They're trembling, verse 15. The fear takes hold upon them. They can't move because of the grip of fear. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31. When the fear and dread, verse 16, hits, <clears throat> you will be still as a stone, a stonied, as the Bible said, paralyzed in fear. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab. It ain't just the weak men. The mighty men are afraid. Trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Imagine seeing big, tough, strong, mean men trembling. That's how the Lord leaves them. They melt away. That's going to match some second coming stuff in your Bible. Joel 2.11. It says, In Joel 2.11, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. That's the army that comes back with him at the second coming. For his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. And who can abide it? Nobody. When he comes back, they're going to melt away. Nobody's going to be able to stand before him. He says, Fear and dread. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. 
By the greatness of thine arm they shall be still as a stone. Till the people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. They're going to be still as a stone. They're going to be like a stone, paralyzed in fear, till the pe thy people pass over. He takes care of his people. And the last point is, I'm on his side. I'm one of his people. I'm one of the purchased. Notice it says, which thou, to, O Lord, to the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. And me and you got something even better than they had, because he, he's purchased us with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. We've been purchased with his, by his own blood. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. So he's going to plant them in the mountain of his inheritance. This is going to be, this is going, looking out into the millennium, Mount Zion. And he's going to plant them there. In Psalm 78, Psalm 78, 54. It says, And he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. He cast out the heathen, heathen also before them, and divided them in an inheritance by line, and made the tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. He says, Thou shalt bring them in, and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, thou hast made for thee to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. See that? That's going out into the millennium and into eternity. The Lord, the men of war, reigns forever and ever. Psalm 10, 16. And Psalm 10 and verse 16, it says, The Lord is king forever. And ever, the heathen are perished out of his land. Nothing can stop his reign. Psalm 29, 10. Psalm 29 and verse 10. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. His reign never runs out. Revelation 11 15 through 17, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So they reign forever, he reigns forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen to the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them, but the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. I'm on his side. Israel was on his side. They got and they got carried through on dry land in the midst of the sea. And then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron and Moses, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Notice dancing isn't forgiven, but it's regulated. You see, they ain't doing the type of dancing that they do today. This is dancing in honor of the Lord. And it says, And Mary, I am answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. There's that triumph gloriously again. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Pharaoh, his chariots, his horsemen, they're all dead. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Right after a big victory, right after a big victory song, you have trouble. And your trouble keeps you close to God. If you're going to God with trouble, it's going to keep you close to God. When something troublous comes your way, go to God. That's what he wants you to do. That's why he allows trouble to come. He doesn't want you to get too puffed up and when things are going good. But they found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. 
Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. So Mara means bitterness. Just like in Ruth 120, she, she's talk, she talks about being called Mara and said, The Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And see, that's what Israel starts doing all the time, murmuring, complaining. They said, What, sh what are we going to drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it, cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So he found this tree. The Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So that tree, that's a picture of Jesus Christ, because you know what Jesus Christ is called? The branch. And Jesus is the branch cast into the waters to sweeten sinful man. In Isaiah 11, 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. Jesus is the branch. And he was cast into the waters. And the waters were made sweet. And it said in verse 26, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. The Lord, the man of war, the Almighty, has healing power. And I'm on his side. He's going to make sure I pass over because I'm his purchased possession. The Savior came down and shed his blood and purchased me with it. Acts 20, 28. And I'm going to be ruling and reigning with him in the millennium one day. If I suffer for him down here. And Jesus is the branch pictured by the tree that sweetened the waters. And I'm on his side. I'm on the branch's side. And he's telling them, if they'll do these things that he commands, he's not going to put any of these diseases upon them. And they came to Elam. There were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees. And they encamped there by the waters. See, he stays taking care of them. Three score, that's sixty and ten, that's seventy. Three uh, score is twenty. So three scores 60 and then 10 more would be 70. It makes 70 palm trees. And then camp there by the waters. So he stays taking care of them. The Lord, the man of war, you get on his side, you're on the right side. And you're going to come through. Because he always comes through. So that is Exodus chapter 15, the almighty man of war.